across the technology landscape. Today we'll focus on Malaysia, the next digital hub for the ASEAN market. We have an incredible lineup of speakers who will present on digital opportunities and success stories in Malaysia. So without any further ado, and to kick off today's session on Malaysia, I'll now hand over to our Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, Mr. Paul Sander. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mani, and um, really a great pleasure to be here. And thanks also to Ron and AIIA um, in putting together what is uh, has been a fantastic um, series on opportunities in tech um, for Australian businesses. Um, I have the honour and privilege of managing our Austrade um, office here in Kuala Lumpur, and as part of that, we're committed to really looking at opportunities for increased collaboration across the technology um, spheres and the digital economy between Malaysia and Australia. I think one of the key points is that both our countries have committed to a comprehensive strategic partnership. And that really means that's the highest level of um, diplomatic and bilateral engagement between two countries. An important part of that is commitment um, to collaboration, to sustainable partnerships in technology and the broader digital economy. And I might just have the next slide, please, Mani. Yes, exactly. So a couple of key points. Um, generally, Malaysia ranks pretty high amongst global indices on competitiveness, on ease of doing business. Um, it's um, like many um, Asian countries, um, there still needs to be a little bit of tweaking in terms of some of the regulatory frameworks, um, and that, but that is um, generally heading in the right direction, and we already have uh, a number of really good success stories of technology collaboration um, within the Malaysian context, and you'll hear from some of them soon. Um, Really, we are talking about, um, you'll hear this about a number of ASEAN markets um, and certainly in the broader Northeast Asia, um, but the digital infrastructure is generally large, comprehensive, and you are dealing with a very, very digitally literate population. Um, the government talks a lot about transition um, to the digital, to more digitalization, to the digital economy, um, but they are serious. Um, so it's not just words. We can um, certainly see it here in the work that we do um, in the promotion of technology collaboration, um, that um, they are serious about really implementing um, more international collaboration. And importantly, uh, many of the agencies um, important to that strategy are agencies like Malaysian Digital Economy Corporation, like MIDA, um, the promotion of uh, investment, like Martrade and Maranti. And you'll hear from our friends at MDEC and Marathi a little bit later today. So I've mentioned the strategic partnership and you can see some of those other, um, other, other information there on the slide. Um, yes, um, recovering pretty well from the COVID pandemic um, and expecting around 4%. Obviously some industry sectors harder hit than others, um, but generally a very, very um, strong and deep relationship um, with Australia. So we estimate that around 400, between 400 and 500,000 Malaysians have been educated in Australia. And Australia's reputation um, for very, very good innovation, for great technology and generally high quality products and services, um, you know, precedes us here. So a very, very well-known commodity is Australia. Um, next slide, please, Mike. So generally the work that we do in helping business, uh, you can see uh, a couple of key points, I suppose, here. Um, you know, looking at potential barriers to smooth trade and partnerships um, where we can um, talk and seek clarification on some of those regulatory frameworks, particularly when it comes to areas of fintech, for example, financial services. Um, we can help with an, an assessment of potential competitors, you know, more in terms of the overall environment. Um, using our badge of government um, within the High Commission to work with Malaysian regulators, um, and also you know, really identifying key opportunities um, where there is demand from Malaysian corporates to look at Australian tech. I've mentioned um, some of our key partners there. Um, and then really it's about some of those business development um, work that we do, the research that we can provide to Australian um, technology providers, um, and then also 
uh, I suppose, access and channels into some of those industry associations and chambers that can also provide insight. Um, I'll leave it there, Mani, and look to just take our participants um, through the agenda. Um, so again, um, for those um, participants um, online today, really a very, very warm welcome. We've got some great speakers lined up. Um, Victor Lowe from um, MDEC. Um, MDEC um, is an organisation that Austrade has a uh, memorandum of understanding, um, a very, very good and robust one. And we've committed to work collaboratively to really look at opportunities um, where Malaysian and Australian firms can, can collaborate for the long term. So Malaysian Digital Economy Corporation, Victor is head of cloud and cyber security. Um, then we'll hear from another key agency in um, Malaysia, Maranti. Maranti is Malaysia's um, really strongest um, accelerator and a really key part of the technology innovation and ecosystem in terms of advice, um, working with ideas or working with companies to accelerate and commercialize them uh, into both Malaysia, but also other international markets. So Carson Ng is International Partnership and Strategy, head of that um, branch of uh, Maranti and mentor in residence. Um, and then a very, very close and old friend of, um, uh, the Austrade office in, in Malaysia, David Albaceta, who is Director of Curb Holdings Asia. Um, and David will take you through exactly what Curb does, but a great Australian success story here um, in the Malaysian market. And then Christopher McMullen from KeyPath Education, um, the account director there, will also look at um, you know, the nexus between education um, and digitalization. Um, and the technology um, that they're working with um, and their, their experience. One, I think, is a very positive one um, in Malaysia, Christopher. So thank you very much for joining us. Then we'll have a quick chat um, with David and Christopher um, just to drill down to some areas of, of their work um, and provide the audience with a few learnings um, about the Malaysian market, um, the implementation of technology, um, but also just about some of the challenges that both of those firms may have experienced here in Malaysia. So I'll leave it um, there. Again, once, once again, thank you very much. And I'll now throw to Victor, if you would like to um, take us off with your presentation, please. Thank you, Paul. So uh, before I begin, probably I would like to share a slide. Uh... Yeah, okay. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Victor. I am representing MDEC for this afternoon's um, uh, opening remarks. Right. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Global Tech Webinar by, by uh, Australia uh, Information Industry Associations to have this uh, opening remark by MDEC. Right. My sharing for this afternoon is pretty much uh, focusing into the uh, insights of uh, Malaysia, right? particularly in the area of Malaysia tech ecosystems. Uh, broadly, I would say is that uh, since uh, 90s, Malaysia has become a long way from lying on uh, industrial and manufacturing activities to being fundamentally knowledge based today. Right? Uh, the Malaysia Super Corridor, or MSC, was an uh, early in initiator in the paradigm shift driven by MDEC, Malaysia Digital Economy Corporations, to develop a conductive digital economy ecosystem through nurturing local ICT champions and attracting global investments. As Malaysia expired to become a high value added economy and net export of homegrown technology and digital solution. The digital economy has uh, becoming one of the biggest contributor to the country GDP today, right? As, of, as we speak today is that um, uh, its contribution to GDP is around 22.6%. And a uh, uh, more exciting journey ahead is that by 2025 forecast to be expected contribution from uh, digital economy to reach 25.5%. Significantly outperform the largest contributor to GDP, like traditional contributor like oil and gas, right? So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think the COVID um, nineteen outbreak have shown have showed us a, a, a real deal of uh, digital adoptions uh, by relying on uh, digital uh, businesses to be more uh, connected, right? Uh, E-commerce has in in that uh, impact or in that benefits of uh, growing uh, fast growing a digital economy. E-commerce has significantly uh, rose by almost 190 billion US dollar, right? That's about 700, about 800 billion ringgit in the first nine months of uh, 2021. 
and uh, this is up 23% from the same period in 2020. So there's a lot of opportunity in the area of uh, digital trade in this case, right? Uh, with the digital economy fundamentally reshaping the industry and driven fourth industrial revolutions, the country respond and plan would have to be uh, comprehensive and integrated. Sustaining the momentum, however, require extensive innovation and supportive government policy, stimulate policy incentive and conductive ecosystem for digital entrepreneurships. Now, uh, MDEC believe we are in a new set of change that, that we have rolled out a new plan to accelerate country digital economy and it's called Malaysia Digital, Malaysia digital Initiative. Presently, uh, uh, Malaysia Digital Economy focus in this uh, few focus area, uh, namely will be area like digital trade, digital agricultures, digital services, digital cities, and digital health. And uh, of course, is that uh, we are not forgetting the area like uh, digital finance, digital content, and digital tourism. So those are the MD focus area that we hope to grow under the new flagship of Malaysia Digital, Malaysia digital Initiative. Malaysia Digital Initiative, initiative by MDEC, converge digital sector with economy today, right? To do so is that it will, it will, it will advocate and promote universal use of digital solution in all economy activities. Right. So in this case, is that you it will re uh, require a lot of stakeholder involvement uh, into an open and uh, and uh, accessible digital tools, knowledge, income opportunity as part of enhanced initiative plan for this program. Malaysia Digital will seek to accelerate participant in the digital economy and address the concern of widening digital divine by providing equitable access to digital tools, knowledge, and income opportunities enhancing Malaysia value proposition to attract more digital investment. Ladies and gentlemen, in closing, uh, MDEC remain focused on enabling a sustainable digital economy. One of that built on a vibrant domestic ICT ecosystem with the goal of transformative adoptions and digital solution by the government, businesses, and citizens. MDEC hopes this forum will enable opportunity to strengthen the bilateral partnership opportunities and enhance the industry collaboration between Malaysia and Australia. I also hope that uh, everyone enjoys the sharing of uh, Malaysia tech ecosystem that uh, uh, MDEC uh, 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 bring forward uh, for this uh, opening remarks. And have a good day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. And um, please, um, my very, very sincere thanks to yourself and everyone else at MDEC for the great support that you're providing to uh, a range of um, Australian um, firms at the moment. Um, so interest in Malaysia um, is strong from Australia and um, one of the key agencies, as, as I've mentioned, responsible for assisting um, entry into the Malaysian market um, is MDEC. So thank you again for, very much for your time today. Um, quickly now, can I ask please, Carson, um, from Maranti, another key agency um, that we work with very, very closely with um, to provide um, some helpful and useful information to our audience today. Thanks, Carson. Thank you so much, uh, Paul. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Global Tech Webinar for the invitation and also a big shout out to Austrid, uh, AWIA, Ron, Paul and uh, Mani to, to uh, do the very uh, interesting introduction for us. And my name is Karsin. I am from the Muranti International Partnership and Outreach Department. Um, I'll be doing the uh, presentation in two, um, two flow. The first, first thing I'll be talking about is the introduction about uh, my organization. Most of you most probably have not heard about. And second uh, portion of my presentation today, I will be focusing on the soft landing platform that we are offering out to the global uh, companies, how you can actually come into Malaysia. So do allow me to take some time to pull up my slide. Okay, um, right. So let's get started. Um, so my organization is called Maranti. Um, Previously, we are a merger between three government agencies. Uh, the first one was MAGIC, stand for Malaysia Global Innovation Co uh, Creativity Center, which we are actually um, uh, very largely looking into the development of a startup and entrepreneurship ecosystem in Malaysia nationally. 
uh, since 2014. And the second agency that merged into Maranti was Core Technology Park Malaysia. Um, it naturally, uh, it was started in 2005. It was a science tech park in Malaysia situated in the uh, outskirts of Kuala Lumpur. And the third government agency that merged into the, uh, this Maranti was called Platform, who were looking after the uh, IP asset offerings and uh, training in Malaysia. So all these three government agencies were under the Ministry of Science, Technology, Innovation. And after the merger uh, uh, established beginning of this 1st of January, we have rebranded into Maranti, and it stands for Malaysian Research Accelerator for Technology and Innovation. So as a government agency, we carry a national aim. We wanted to be a science tech hub for um, technology innovation, commercialization, and also scientific excellence. So the keyword for Maranti uh, moving forward is that um, R&D commercialization from idea to impact. And we serve as the platform that we are talking to Quartable Helix recorded from the government sectors, um, the corporate, the private sectors, academia, institutionals, uh, and also civil society into a platform to strike innovative related uh, conversation and um, inheriting thing from uh, Technology Park Malaysia. Now we are situated in a land of 686 hectares uh, in Bukit Jalil. So on the right side, that is the uh, uh, ministry identified focus on technology, um, green tech, agri-tech. I'm sure um, agriculture is because um, um, Malaysia is uh, huge into uh, agriculture and biotech is due to uh, post-COVID. Everybody, um, is looking into health um, um, in improvement. Smart manufacturing is also because um, Malaysia 90 over percent and above uh, consists of small and medium sized uh, enterprises. Hence, we would like to uh, focus on these six clusters uh, for the agency. Okay. So besides that, they are technology that is supporting the clusters that we are building and developing. Um, it's has been gone into two phases. The first phase starts this year, uh, where we established, and then to 2030, into uh, prioritizing the autonomous vehicle, automation and robotics, biotechnology development, drone tech, 3D printing, and 5G. The rest will be 2024 and beyond. So this is what we have um, in Moranti. Uh, two branches in the police, one of the states in Malaysia, and Rao in Pahang. And our HQ is located uh, outskirts of Bukit Jalil. Um, to KLCC, it takes about 35 minutes. And then uh, to the KL International Airport, it's approximately 45 minutes uh, different away. Right? So this is what we have in plan for the, uh, for the future for Maranti. We are uh, developing different different uh, living lab that is uh, in alignment with the cluster that we, we plan to develop. Um, we have a bio, bio, bioscience tech living lab, uh, 4IR flexible uh, precision manufacturing living lab, autonomous vehicle living lab, bioscience tech lab, which uh, two weeks ago, it was actually launched by two of the Minister of Nature, uh, by the Ministry of Science, as well as the Ministry, Minister of Health. And um, the whole part is actually covered with 5G. We are awaiting uh, internet service provider to, to be, to be uh, in cooperation with us to deploy the service. Um, um, the next one would be the Agri-Tech Living Lab. And uh, the last one is Drone Tech Living Lab. We call it the Area 57. So I'll go deep, slightly deeper into the Area 57, which we already uh, launched last year, September 16, and then uh, we target to uh, complete uh, within 2023. It's a five acre land that we are developing the uh, drone testing facilities for our community uh, to be running the sandbox and validating their business. So these are some of the identified um, applications for the drone uh, tech. Um, into the agriculture, the logistics, home making, defense, disease control, and so on and so forth. 
And also, we are in developing a uh, AV living lab, a 12 kilometer test bit with a actual trail uh, that covers the entire area of the science park. Expected uh, estimated uh, completion date uh, by quarter one, 2023. And these are some of the AV living uh, lab facility that are in plan. Uh, and uh, uh, we are in discussion with the potential uh, uh, international partners or local partners. For, for such um, uh, launching. Like on the right side, the Violet Charging Station will be working uh, closely with another government agency called Nano Malaysia for the deployment, as well as Autonomous E-Buggy and uh, Project King Bug. So another area is that uh, we consistently wanted to um, um, develop the physical, um, the, the product development, um, Cycle supply chain of our SMEs. Hence, um, we we constantly uh, looking into partners to offer uh, related uh, services to be deployed and uh, to be tested in, in in the living lab here for manufacturers. And uh, besides that, we run we do have program uh, MTIS stands for National Technology Innovation Sandbox. As of state, we have nine uh, national sandbox that has been launched while working in uh, with different agency as well as uh, private companies. For example, uh, in agriculture sandbox, we work with Velda, one of the largest agriculture agency in Malaysia, uh, robotic and autonomous um, sandbox, and uh, logistic sandbox with uh, A Asia. Um, MMU is one of the Malaysia multimedia universities. We are working with them on a high tech um, education sandbox, for tech and uh, sandbox and so forth. Um, so in Moranti, uh, we are trying to bring the best of both worlds because of when magic comes in with the program, it is giving a soul to the, to the landowner of um, technology park previously that uh, we have here. Um, and uh, we have various programs for different stages of um, the companies. So today we will be focusing very much on uh, the program that is relevant to the audience here, especially on the go-to-market on how external or uh, international companies who wish to do business in Malaysia have an entry into assessing all this uh, facility here. So the program that we will be focusing very much is called the My Startup Hub that uh, my cursor is pointing. So in order for us to, um, to fill up the spaces and complete the supply chain and the ecosystem for, the, uh, for continuous growth of innovation, we required the help of international companies to do um, uh, knowledge transfer or even um, 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 deployment of your technology into uh, into uh, our space here. Hence, um, we consistently have com conversation with them and we found out these are some of the area that uh, international companies face. First of all, they are very difficult for them to hire talent. The reason being is um, most probably when they come to Malaysia, they are considered a startup and nobody actually uh, have um, confidence to work for you. However, through this program, um, Ranti is giving you the credibility that uh, um, to, the, to increase the confidence for the local talent to work for you. And uh, the second area is uh, naturally when what you want to uh, set up a business in Malaysia, you are looking into a longer processing time for foreign entrance. And then uh, of course, um, the culture gap would be something for you to learn before doing business here. So hence, uh, we have a platform is a soft landing platform um, that is targeted for international uh, innovative companies uh, all around the world, as well as uh, inclusive of Australia to set up a business hub in Malaysia. In this program, uh, we are working together with other ministries and also agencies such as uh, MIDA, Madrid, now and also MDEC. Um, through their help, we are able to offer um, assistance in three areas, which is the company registration, um, local talent acquisition, and eventually we can actually get you connected to the local uh, companies for your market assessment. Okay. 
So who should be in this platform? We are inviting uh, companies who are readily to set up a business having ASEAN, and also considering Malaysia a potential hub. Uh, and you are at a stage where you are looking into expansion. Um, and you are within the six clusters. However, we are not just limited to just six clusters that I have mentioned. We also open up to others. Right. So this is some of the stages for the program. I believe I will not go so much into detail. Perhaps if any companies who are interested to come into Malaysia, we can have a conversation. Um, directly with me, and then um, we will be able to get access to uh, infrastructure in Malaysia, such, such as um, from the northern and southern region. We have the NCER, who is covering the four stages of uh, Perlis, Kedah, Perak, and Pulau Pinang. And then um, on, on the south of Malaysia, we have Iskandar, Malaysia. And uh, on the Borneo of Malaysia, which is the east, Malaysia, we have Tegat, Sarawak Digital Corporation, SDEC, as well as Sabah Creative Economy and uh, Innovative Center. And not forgetting, we also have infrastructure in the center region, um, Cyber Jaya by uh, Cyberview, Selangor Information uh, Technology and Digital Economic Corporation, CDEC in the Selangor State, run by the uh, Selangor State Government. And of course, not forgetting MDEC, Invest KL, who is very specific into KL, and Maranti ourselves here. So these are some of the global companies who have uh, come on to our platform, and then we have assisted them. And these are some of the success stories that we have assisted. So I would like to pass back the floor to the host, and thank you so much. Thank you very, very much, Kazin, for that really comprehensive and fascinating presentation. Um, I, have a, I have a myriad of questions that I'd like to ask, but in view of the time, um, just thanks again. Um, thanks to you and the Moranti team for the assistance that you provide um, to Australian startups and um, also my team as well. So thank you again for joining us today. Um, David, um, tell us about the Curb success story, please. A very Malaysian one. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, let me share my screen quickly. From the beginning. So, all right. So first of all, Paul, I mean, uh, let me thank uh, the Australian Trade Commission, um, Investment Commission in Malaysia, and obviously the Australian Information and Industry Association for, for inviting me today to talk a little bit about um, about what CURB does and uh, our uh, journey in Malaysia. Always a pleasure to, to share um, with you guys and to learn from uh, my fellow um, co-panelists. I have a couple of slides here um, about uh, CURB, but I will not really go into detail in, and it should not take us very long. I guess today, the purpose of this session is to, 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 to discuss Malaysia and the opportunities that it might have to other companies back home in, in Australia. Nevertheless, um, maybe sharing what we have done in Malaysia and who are our customers here in Malaysia might be, might be helpful uh, to some of the companies that might be uh, considering uh, entering uh, this market. So very quickly, I mean, I mean, who we are. So yes, so we are a tech company. Curb uh, is a global uh, parking platform, um, and what we do is that we connect drivers with uh, car park owners through our platform. So for the drivers, it's a it's a B two C app. So you open your app, and then you can find uh, car park spaces available, and then through your phone, you can book. Um, the, your parking, you can pay, you can access. It's an app-based solution, everything to the phone. And for the car park owner or for the operator, it's a software platform that is uh, completely digital that basically allows to run any car park with uh, very little uh, infrastructure and um, uh, really I mean, um, beneficial um, cost. So, 
Curtis Australian. It was founded in um, already five, six years ago. Uh, and uh, for the last two years, uh, three years, uh, with the pandemic, uh, everything gets a bit out of, out of time. We, we've been here in Malaysia. And since day one, since we entered the Malaysian market, um, we, we found this market to be very receptive of, uh, of our product. And we have had um, good successes. We have an interesting portfolio of, of customers in both the, the private and the public sector. And that's a bit uh, what I wanted to share a bit today, because there might be companies that uh, they might be targeting one or both. And um, I guess they both require a little bit of a, a different uh, approach than as anybody else in the, in the world, I guess. So one of the customers we are, we're dealing with is uh, Sunway, which is a major uh, property group. It's uh, public listed. Um, and uh, that was actually uh, one of our first customers uh, in Malaysia. Uh, which comes to tell you of the of the appetite um, in Malaysia from some of these leading companies to to really to innovate and to adopt new te new technologies and uh, and new solutions. And so we are providing our our services in some of the office uh, buildings in Kuala Lumpur. We are also, for example, working with a hospital. We have one of our pep zones where people uh, can uh, book in advance and they have a secure car park. When, when they arrive. Um, so again, different uh, different type of profile, but again, a, a hospital, in this case, in the healthcare industry, but um, something that is really going very well and we're very proud of it. And um, Setia Spy, uh, Setia Spy, Setia Spy belongs to SP Setia. SP Setia is another leading property group um, in, uh, in Malaysia. In this case, we are providing, uh, we have launched our solution in the, um, in the convention center uh, in Penang. And um, yeah, that's also something that we're very proud of and um, it's going very well. Um, I guess uh, worthwhile pointing that Malaysia, of course, I mean, as obvious as it seems, is not only Kuala Lumpur, obviously there are other uh, cities that uh, might offer opportunities and, and Penang is one of them. In our case, Penang is, uh, this is the only project that currently we have, but we are looking forward to, to really expand in that part of, um, of the country as well. Now, maybe um, coming back to what I was mentioning at the beginning, uh, more the, the public uh, sector, just to share a little bit how, how we manage uh, to, to, to engage um, with, in this case, with the Kuala Lumpur City Council or with Prasarana, which is the owner and operator of um, the rail services here in, um, in Malaysia. Uh, last year, we, we won um, a competition sponsored uh, by the Toyota Mobility Foundation. Uh, last year, this uh, competition took place in Kuala Lumpur and we, the, the idea of the competition was to come up with, um, with an interesting uh, proposal for mobility solutions for, for the city. So that's what we did, and we uh, were lucky enough to, to, to win. Um, and this gave us the opportunity to roll out our solution in conjunction with um, the likes of Endex, uh, Prasarana, and DBKL, which, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, is a Kuala Lumpur City Council. So a fantastic opportunity for us to, to really uh, engage uh, with the public sector after such a short period of time uh, in the market. So just to show a little bit, so Prasarana, as I said, is, uh, is the owner and operator of the country's rail services. They have what they call park and ride facilities, which are car parks that are attached to the, to the train station so that the commuters, they can drive to the train station, leave the car, jump into the train and, um, and go into the city. So that was very, very welcome because it allowed the commuters to book the car park space in advance um, and it reduced the uncertainty of uh, not finding a car park spot uh, on the way to, to work. Another project uh, that we're very, uh, very happy uh, to be currently conducting is with uh, DBKL, again, for Lumpur City Council. Um, where <clears throat> Kuala Lumpur City Council uh, owns many, many public uh, car parks um, in, in the city. And now we have uh, launched in six on the car park. 
and so that's also something that uh, we are we are we are very proud of it and I'm very happy about it. <clears throat> so so that's it. Um, yes, um, I, I think I want to leave uh, the the time for for the panel discussion. I just want to give you a, a short overview on what what is that what we do, who are we dealing with, and I hope this will prompt um, enough uh, questions for for later on. Thank you, David. Uh, really fantastic and um, really great to see the progress that Curb's making um, in terms of your business development um, within Malaysia. And I know that um, uh, Curb um, really is uh, grateful to Malaysia and the opportunities that have been provided um, to expand the business and obviously to learn um, and overcome those, you know, some of those early barriers um, in terms of your internationalization. Um, so thank you, David, for your time today. Um, Christopher, um, over to you, please, um, and um, give our audience a, a feel for your Malaysian journey. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Paul, and, and thank you to Austrade and, and Ron and AIIA as well for the opportunity to speak today. So my name is Chris McMullen, and I work for a company called Key Park Education, and I thought I'd use about five minutes today to give a bit of an overview as to what Key Path Education do um, and also why we are playing in the Malaysian market and uh, some of the market entry considerations that were relevant for our expansion. So Key Path Education is a global OPM business, which stands for Online Program Management. What we do is we partner with universities to help them design, develop and deliver online university programs. So predominantly in the postgraduate space. And we've been doing this for a number of years with programs all across the world. Um, we decided to enter into the Malaysian market uh, in 2021, in early 2021, and have a partnership with the university in Malaysia, Sunway University. Um, and we've been doing some fantastic things with them to date. In terms of the, uh, the company, I'll give a couple of high level overviews as to, to what we've done and where we operate, and then sort of speak specifically around why we want to work in Malaysia and where we see the opportunity. So the company was founded in 2014 and we've got uh, six global offices all around the world and are currently listed on the ASX in Australia. Um, 40 global university partners that we work with, over 170 online postgraduate programs, uh, more than 80,000 online course enrollments and we've got students coming from many, many places around the world. Some of the partners that we work with, the university partners, are quite well known, particularly in the ASEAN region. Um, Sunway University, as I mentioned before, is our main partner in Malaysia at this point in time. Um, but we also work with a variety of universities in the USA, Canada, the UK, and Australia as well. So online program management, um, the types of programs that we generally run with our university partners um, stretch across all disciplines. I think everyone's probably familiar with the concept of an online MBA or an online data science program, but we've got programs with our university partners around the world in areas of everything from business to healthcare, logistics, um, IT, and law and engineering, and so on and so forth. So we're very much discipline agnostic when we work with universities. The idea is to help them put degrees online and find areas where there's a genuine market need. So where there's either industry or students who want to study something or a skill gap in the market, we help the universities provide a market-led online program to meet that opportunity. Why Malaysia and why what's happening in the, uh, the online education space? So I've got a couple of um, points to get through on this slide. Very quickly, the global higher education market, so thinking about the universities in particular, um, is very, very large and continues to grow over time. And the fantastic uh, chart that I've got on the left-hand side is from a, a market intelligence agency called Holon IQ, who do some wonderful work. And they also provide some guidance as to where online programs um, or global online uh, education is sort of going in the next couple of years, and then particularly for the OPM businesses. So specifically for companies like KeyPath, who work with universities to help them scale and develop these online programs. So pre and post COVID, we've noticed some really positive trends in how this space is going. And, uh, and particularly after the last two years, when 
we were generally forced to operate in a, uh, in a work from home or a remote working capacity. We really saw not only an acceleration in terms of interest in online programs, but then also with universities who wanted to, to upskill and, uh, and to engage with a, a, a partner like KeyPath to help them do something that they weren't able to do anyway. So that's a more global sort of perspective as to why online education and where's the OPM or online program management space working. Now, why Malaysia or Southeast Asia in particular? There's a couple of really key high level indicators that sparked our interest years and years ago. Not only is there a really significant and high population within the ASEAN region or Southeast Asian region, but the average age is quite young. And with that average age and high level of, uh, of English proficiency, there's also a lot of digital um, uh, savviness, if you will. So digital penetration within these markets, the ASEAN markets, is very, very high. When KeyPath decided to expand into Asia uh, a year and a half ago, we chose Malaysia and Singapore to be our first two market entry points, and, uh, and they've been very successful to date. So I think a couple of the other things that we wanted to consider when assessing which market to go in into and why is, are there any other broader overarching policy um, from the government perspective, uh, considerations that we need to take into account? And we saw some favourable movements with both Malaysia and Singapore's governments for both um, for both of those countries, particularly around online education. So some positive policy movements which supported uh, a company like Keeper partnering with universities in both of those countries and more broadly in the region as well. Now, I know we're running out of time and I've got a couple of quick considerations um, for market entry that I think some of the people who are, who are watching this, um, this webinar today might find interesting. From our company's point of view, operating in the education space, I've just brought up four key high level areas of, of awareness or consideration for anyone who's thinking of entering the market. The first one is around the legal um, frameworks and legal environment. Uh, we found that you know, setting up as a local employer and understanding things like employment law and a variety of other pieces was something that we needed to get our heads around. And we we'd spent some time and effort in terms of understanding that play and, and hiring some external help to give us some support and some guidance. Um, also, because we work with universities, but KeyPath is not a brand that's known to the student who studies, so we're a white label provider, we also have to deal with some unique intricacies around representing a Malaysian organisation whilst not being that organisation themselves. And particularly starting off as an Australian business, entering the Malaysian market, it was something that we just had to be aware of. A really important piece in the education space is working with the government policies and government agencies that oversee education within the country or the region. So within Malaysia, it's the Ministry of Higher Education and the Malaysian Qualifications Agency. And working with those agencies has proven to be a little bit difficult, a little bit challenging. Some of their policies seem a little bit unclear and sometimes they can change on a whim. Um, also, we have to be, uh, we have to be aware that approval times and, and whatnot, things that we might expect to happen different in other markets, for instance, in Australia, where we're sort of based and coming from, take a little bit of a different approach and a different timeline in Malaysia and something for us to be aware of. Another key consideration was around societal factors and we had some hiring um, challenges that we worked through. So expectations from our new hires and the people that were recruiting around timeliness, completing assessment tasks, um, the use of online interviews, you know, salaries that are treated on a month by month basis, as opposed to an annual basis as they normally are in Australia. Um, government benefits are, are worked into the mix as well. And we also had to sort of navigate through some societal expectations around flexible working practices. I think in Australia and other parts of the world, we've, um, we've taken a, a, a number of leaps and strides over the last couple of years around flexible working. And we found that particularly in Malaysia with some of our our hires in country. Um, it's been a bit of a journey to, to go on with them, to educate them as to, to what our global policies are around working from anywhere and what the, uh, and what the, the lay of the land will be for them going forward. Um, and we've currently got 24 staff members um, in, uh, in Malaysia right now. And since we started in 2021, I think there's, we're heading in the, in the right direction, that's for sure. The final sort of market consideration I'll touch on really quickly is, is financially based opening up bank accounts um, and trying to enter the market from Australia where we didn't have a local Malaysian leader um, as a resource at that point in time proved to be uh, something we just needed to be aware of and finding the right ways to, uh, to get around that. Um, so yes, 
These are a couple of the, the high level market entry considerations. I'm sure they're applicable to, to several of the other um, speakers today. And, and I'm sure for anyone who's thinking about entering the Malaysian market, there'll be not only be these types of considerations, but others to think about as well. Okay, that's it for me. Paul, I'll head back to you. Well, thank you very much, Christopher. That was really a fascinating um, presentation and certainly a lot there um, that we would also endorse in terms of the considerations really for any business, um, but obviously appropriate um, to anyone in the education um, and particularly the online education space. Um, so thank you once again for your time. Um, it's been a really, really good information and insights there, much appreciated. Um, we have uh, a little bit of time now just to have um, a couple of quick questions um, for both David and Christopher in terms of drilling down a little bit um, into to your own um, journey in terms of Malaysia um, and the internationalization of your businesses here. Um, firstly, perhaps if I start with you, David, um, I know one, obviously partners, and you've both mentioned a number of your partners have been really um, critical to your success. Um, but how would you describe your experience in Malaysia and then assisting you to then launch into other um, ASEAN markets or even you know, other markets further afield? I mean, what lessons do you think um, that Malaysia has been able to give you which has provided a launch pad into some of those other markets. David. Yeah, thank, thank you, uh, Paul. I mean, uh, we always hear about um, Malaysia being a, a gateway for, for ASEAN. Um, in our case, has been a little bit uh, the case. So um, Malaysia was the first Southeast Asian market that, uh, that we entered. Um, and, um, and then from here, actually, while being here, we've been able to expand into countries like, um, like Thailand. Um, next week, I'm going to the Philippines and even countries like, uh, like Singapore. So for us, really, it, it makes sense. Uh, of, of course, we know that ASEAN is not a single market. Of course, uh, they are far away from, uh, from it. But nevertheless, um, uh, I guess, once you set, settle here, if you can uh, manage to do business here, somehow uh, you get a bit of a feeling for what's going to be happening in neighboring markets. Again, Thailand is very different, uh, Indonesia is very different, but um, if you can crack it here, you probably want to be able to crack it in, uh, in the neighboring markets. Um, and I guess for us, Malaysia was um, the logical choice at the beginning and the fact that uh, it's an English speaking country, so Commonwealth, so that makes it easy um, in this sense. So definitely, yes. So we did use it a bit as a, as a way, gateway into ASEAN, that's right. Thanks, David, thank you. And Chris, um, from your point of view, one, I think I'm, I'm probably pretty interested as to whether or not there are companies um, doing similar things, um, you know, to, to the service um, and that you provide. Um, any competitors actually in the market, but just also carrying on from David's point, um, do you think that there are things that you've learned um, within the Malaysian environment that you can take um, then to other markets? Yeah, it's a really great question, Paul. And I might, I might address the second part first. So I think one of the key learnings from the, the education context coming from Australia and entering into the Malaysian space was the role in which government or external government agencies, um, the role that they play in, in everything that you do relating to education. In Australia, it's uh, the way that it works is the universities have got a bit more agency and ownership over how they regulate programs, how they introduce new programs, the various frameworks that they can operate under, and they've just got a little bit more scope for control in their own direction. One of the key things that we've learned through the Malaysian experience, which is translating quite closely into Singapore and other markets too, is really understanding what the, the policy frameworks from a government perspective are and ensuring that we're aligning with, with what they look like um, and, and you know, using them to our advantage the best way that we possibly can and understanding the limitations as to how they play with, with our business model, with our organization and how we go about doing things. In terms of the competitor question, um, one of the reasons why we chose Malaysia and one of the reasons why uh, Key Path is expanding um, beyond Australia into the, uh, the Southeast Asian region is generally due to a lack of genuine competition in online um, programs. 
Uh, we know we know there's a very large addressable market in terms of English speaking uh, young professionals who either want to upskill their careers or, or change careers and online education is a medium for them to do that. And there aren't many universities who are either doing it themselves effectively or most interestingly, there aren't many other OPMs who are partnering with universities to help them design and deliver these fit for purpose online programs. So for us, it was a pretty obvious opportunity where you've got a market where the product that we're introducing doesn't really exist. There's a large addressable target audience um, who would be interested in this product going forward. And we've got a genuine lack of competitors in the space. So, you know, from a general market analysis point of view, there's a couple of ticks there, Paul, that we thought this makes a, a really interesting opportunity for us to explore in greater detail, hence why we're now in the region. No, thanks, Chris. And obviously, the lack of that um, competition in itself um, brings about challenges and considerations that, you know, one might not think of if they're a direct competitor. So, so thanks for those insights. That's great. Um, we don't have much time, um, David, but um, can I just, um, I'm springing this question a bit out of left field, um, but in terms of combining a sort of marketing strategy for Curb um, in Malaysia, you know, with the actual tech application that you have, how much time do you think you've spent thinking about or resourcing um, an actual marketing um, and communication strategy for Curb? Has it been important, I suppose, is, is what I'm asking. Yeah, definitely. Um, it is important and it takes a lot of time. Um, in our case, um, I mean, being a, a new technology company, um, we're not only we're new, we in generally were new, uh, no matter which market you go. So it's a new concept uh, we're trying to do. We're trying to disrupt the, the, the packing industry. So, so uh, we're trying to create new behaviors uh, in the user side. And, um, and obviously to convince customers of, of it, I mean, uh, requires time. Uh, and Malaysia has not been an exception. So definitely, uh, I mean, uh, communication is key. Create, creating the name and the brand awareness uh, in the market. Um, it's, it's, it's key, it's very important, and, uh, and definitely uh, you need it. Uh, you cannot ignore it, so definitely you have to spend uh, time and money on it. Thanks, David. Thanks. Um, look, I'll leave our audience um, you know, with that um, quite pertinent um, a point in terms of you know the need to also consider marketing and communications, um, and it's, it's, it's a rare product or service that actually doesn't need um, you know, that strategy to, to back up um, the, the customer engagement and um, partnerships. Look, thank you very much, um, Christopher, David, and to our other speakers, Cassian. Thank you. Um, apologies from Victor to our audience. Um, he needed to catch a flight. Um, so sincere apologies that he's, he's actually dropped off um, the uh, webinar. But look, what's next? Well, um, for any of um, our audience looking to engage with Malaysia, um, or for that matter, get some insights into other ASEAN markets, please do reach out. Um, and I'm sure David, Christopher, Kassin and Victor will welcome um, direct contact. But there um, are our contacts um, up on the screen from um, Austrade. And can I thank my colleague, um, firstly, Daniel Hamilton, um, who is our business development manager in charge of um, our work in disruptive technologies and advanced tech um, for his work in putting this together, but also the work that he's done um, in assisting Australian tech companies. Um, so thanks, Daniel, for your, for your input. Um, I think that we're pretty much on time. Once again, to our participants who I note um, have seen us um, through the whole hour, um, really much appreciated. Thank you again from the Austrade team here in Kale, from our speakers. Um, thanks to Ron and his team at AIIA. And Mani, of course, um, thank you for your, for your efforts. And I'll throw it back to you if that's okay. Yes, thank you, Paul. Uh, so that does bring up, uh, uh, that does bring us to the end of our session today. So I'd like to echo Paul and take a moment to again thank our speakers and what fantastic insights they've all shared today. I'd also like to thank Ron and the team at AIIA, as well as Daniel and the team behind the scenes for their support in producing today's session. 
Finally, I'd like to thank our audience for, this, for, for their attendance today. We certainly hope you've enjoyed the session. And as I said at the top, this is one of a series. And we would like to see you all again for our next session featuring Indonesia on the 4th of October. To close today's session, I'll hand back to Ron. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Marnie. Thanks, Paul. And to all our speakers, uh, thank you for brilliant presentations. Uh, clearly, there's plenty of opportunity in Malaysia. So uh, I uh, would like to think that uh, our uh, audience today would find those opportunities and find the uh, presentations extremely useful. As I said at the top, uh, the recording will be made available to all those who registered and all those who are uh, AAA members. And I know that we do have a viewing audience of the recordings. Uh, those who uh, uh, find that more convenient, but certainly very much appreciate the support of Austrade and uh, look forward to the next session. Until then, everyone, please stay well and stay safe and look forward to seeing you at our next event on the 4th of October. Thank you. Thank you.